In the previous episode, we built up this menu button that is known from the PVC fly, but we did so with our own layer structure over here, just full of dummy actions that you can populate. That's a different video. We are talking about navigation, how to build up multiple layers and, and menus and so on, and then a button that would navigate it all. So let me show you what we have. When we press the lower edge on this one, it is changing between camera selection and preset selection. That is essentially these two layers. So camera layers are now visible preset layers are visible if we press the upper edge we are basically cycling the menu on the upper buttons here and that is shown if you go into the menu folder which is always visible you see that the visibility of these four pages is changed cycled as i'm pressing this one we even changed a little bit the order of things by hard coding that it should go from page one to three to two to four and so forth and then roll over so that was a little bit of fun we had there the reason why this happens is because we are using a, a variable called select page to drive the visibility of the layers select page is equal to any of these four values you see right there and that variable is down here so when i press this top edge of the button I am cycling these values with the event handler that I created. That event handler was called menu cycle. And inside of menu cycle, we are edge filtering on the top edge of the button. We are cycling up and rolling over between these values that are called set values. So the values we set, and then it's all happening to the parameter called variable uh, select page, which is this one. The same is true for select page, uh, preset page, camera page. Those variables are used to drive the paging here. So if I press the sides, you can see that preset page is going all the way up to the max value of three, and then it can go down to the lowest value of one. And the same is true for cam page, but that's only when we go in here, then we're changing that up and down. And the reason why it doesn't happen, except if we are on the camera preset, is that if you um, go to the behavior and you look at the event handlers, we decided to embed a condition that cam page down should only be active if cam or pre equals cam. And just likewise for the cam page up. But if you look at preset page down and up, then they, it's only active if we are on the preset. So that was a little bit of recap of what we covered in the previous video. And then we added colors and feedback and watch that video if you want to know how it works. But the, the, the thing is, how does this actually look for the, the standard configuration we are using in uh, in React, the ones that most of you will just use. This is like totally behind the scenes and uh, it may freak you out to see all these layers and all this stuff in the inspector over here. So it's definitely master masterclass. It is uh, advanced things for those of you who want to master the powers of the reactor. And um, but but we uh, we have this available as uh, standard behaviors we can share and and that's usually how you use the system but we want to see how it's done inside of reactor in those default configurations and we also want to go to our good old friend unisketch so this is why i fire up coursecarry.com which is where you guys would maybe have uh, called your home um, for a long time with a uh, controller so if we go to a pdc fly Model right here. Let's take one for any PTC camera we could imagine. Take this old new tech NDI camera here. We go to advanced to see how this controller works and we click on, on button number six. Then what you see here in these drop downs is essentially doing what we have implemented in Reactor. But it is kind of more, more um, locked up in certain patterns that cannot be changed as radically as they can be changed inside Reactor. Reactor is completely free. And this one is completely locked down to the to the only features that we have given you. The first thing that happens here is that we have this. Um, <laughs> first of all, you can't really see the separation of things. But this is saying this button should have the ice system color. So those colors are the same that you know from Reactor. But that's what we are setting right here. We are also saying that um, uh, the off uh, situation is dim for it. And then this little AND divider right there is what gives you, actually, we, we could change this around a little bit. Let's just remove these states and that helps a little bit on the visibility. Or even this one, yeah. <clears throat> so now we can better see it. Color is here. The next thing that happens is we say, okay, going on from this point in time, we are only passing the down edge trigger of the button. So only if the down edge on the button is pressed, then we are having this action executed and what it does is it sets the state of register p and the state value is one and it's going to toggle between this one and zero 
we also have added an image, which is the image of the button. So that had to be done right there, even though there would be other places where we could have selected images, like down here, for instance. But no, 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 it had to be done right here. Why? Because now we have these multiple actions, and there's a certain rule, which is the first one, the first action is defining what the button's feedback is going to be. See, that is separated in Reactor. Their feedback is something that you have to design. You have to decide what, which of the parameters I'm affecting is going to affect the feedback in certain ways. And here it is locked to the order of actions. So it's far more limited right here, but it's in a sense also simpler, also simpler obviously. But then we get to the next one, which is this transform four-way behavior that says now, at this point, block the up and down. That remains uh, means that we have left and right back, uh, left, right. And um, then, so left and right edges is now moved into this one call, called force HVC type. And that converts the four-way button triggers left and right into pulsed um, feedback. And that pulse feedback is now going into shift level action that will allow you to go up to level number two. So that means from zero to one to two, from zero to one to two, and so on. And uh, as you are pressing the edges left and right of the button, again, it's kind of locked down because we are changing, we're basically saying that we want to convert the, the, the four-way button triggers left and right into pulsed functionality and then feed it into this. Then comes another four-way behavior that is saying pass only the presses on the other edge of the button. And when we do so, we are now forcing the hardware component type back to binary. And when it's back to binary here, we feed it into setting the state to four, or basically it's, it's using the modifier cycle up. So it's cycling the state from zero up to four on the standard state register, not register P as up here, but the standard. So whew, see all those registers we're using here, they are the same, in a sense, as the var variables we are creating, because those registers are used to then to, to have like individual menus in the system. There, there's like a section for the camera selector, one for the encoders, but it's not freely defined like we can do it in Reactor, where we can create layers with the exact behaviors we want. Here, it is all locked down to certain sections that need some kind of you know, elaborate uh, pattern of assigning these registers and so on. So it's a little bit... Uh, Unisketch is great in many ways, but it's also limited by these registers that you need to understand and assign, and you, you need to design all that. In Reactor, you get absolute freedom. And by the way, keep in mind that whatever we have in Reactor, like what this PDC fun layer is, I could copy this a million times inside the same structure, and these variables wouldn't be the same. In other words, I could drive a million PC fly controllers independently from the same configuration because it's all arranged in the tree. Unisketch could never do anything like that. There you have 10 registers of something and it's not going to change and it's shared between everything. So this is the power of Reactor. We just need to make sure that it's all like tamed and uh, used for the common good. Um, so that's something of the vision and a little bit of comparison on how did we achieve the same thing on Unisketch as we did over here. If you then, let's just close this one down. That was the JSON editor we were looking at last time. And if we want to see how is this actually done inside a, a normal configuration, uh, the default configuration that comes out of the box with Reactor, then we could just add another panel, so a PDC fly more. And we do that. There we go. And what happens when you just add any panel is that it's searching for the most common default configuration that we have made for that panel. And that's the generic PTC control you see right here. One of the cool things about that is how easy it is to add, pan, uh, add cameras. So we have already added some, some cameras in this configuration. We can quickly throw into the camera selector here, right there. Um, and and we did this in the very first episode just to like set the ground. But this configuration, if we go into the configuration tab, what you'll see is that we have like three main layers. We have one for the blue pill. Um, that's just driving the display content on the blue pill right here in the displays. Then we have this layer, which is our experiment, where we have the layers we have created here. And then finally, we have this Skahoy curated configuration PTC fly default that has a lot of very advanced things inside of it going on. 
So I, I want to show you a little bit what that is. And it, it, it may definitely freak you out. But just keep in mind that this is our programming. This is what enables you to sit here on the home screen and have easy to use blue buttons that will give you access to lists of cameras where you can change their labels, easily have that into the displays of the camera selector, set up tally and routing indexes for your switcher to have nice tally coming in. All the complexity of that has been taken care of by us and provided to you with the minimum of configuration you need in this table. And that's what we are doing um, to make it easy for all the standard stuff you want to do. You, if you look in the configuration of that, it is really complex. But there's many of the same patterns that we have been using. And one of them is if we, if we take uh, the new PTC fly we just added to the mix here, that is, um, <clears throat> this is the one that is driving our, uh, or driven by this configuration. Then notice if I, if I click this button here to turn on and on, let's just select the camera. So we select the camera and I use this one to toggle between camera selection and preset selection. It is changing a variable that is here called show cam selector between hide and show. Okay, that corresponds to the variable we created that is called camera pre. I just chose a different name and I chose different values. So cam and pre up here, I press the lower edge and you see it's going between cam and pre. And it's sort of doing the same thing down in the official configuration. It is just a different variable name and it's different values. Same principle. Now let's press the upper edge. If I press this one repeatedly, you see that I am also changing the menu here. But if you notice over in the variables, it, it's got to be the one called setting page. You see setting page is the variable that is changing its values as I'm pressing. What did we do up here? It was called, called select page. And that's what happens when you click the upper edge up here. So that is now rotating. What about the edges? I click the edges here. This is changing the camera page. That's this variable up there. You see between two options. And then if I go to my presets, it's probably this one called preset page. Notice that variable. Yes, it goes all the way up to four, all the way down to one, all the way up to four. Now, uh, guys, actually, one of the reasons why this has to be sort of complex is that you, you notice the camera page. We have only two pages, but automatically this will be more pages if we went back to our camera selector and we added more cameras. So I'm, I'm holding down shift and then I'm adding a few more cameras so we have some more camera pages, okay? So as I just did that and we go back to the configuration tab here, you'll see that um, my camera page is now bigger. I have three pages. This is page one, this is page two, this is page three. And this variable up here is um, now, it, it knows that it has three pages now. This is because of something called generators in the system. And generators is used for camera selectors. It is used for inputs on video switches that will respond to the configuration you did on the home screen. This, they are called constant sets. This is the stuff you see down here. And actually the constant sets that we use for the camera selector is on this default layer down here. So if I click that, you'll actually see exactly what you saw on the home screen inside the configuration tab. It is right there here. And uh, this is what is driving the camera pages. Okay, so you see these variables are in fact in place. And if we go up here under normal operation, then we could go into the camera selector. You see camera selector has three pages. And that would be just notice one, two, three. And if I go back to home, and if I added even more cameras, or I could also remove some of them. Okay, it's still more fun to add cameras, right? So I'll just hold down shift and add a bunch more of these. Okay, so now we have really many cameras here. We go back to configuration tab. Now notice what happens here. I now have four layers of cameras generated because the constant set dictated that with a page size of five cameras, we now need to distribute them across four pages. And I'm now paging these pages. And by the way, how are they shown visibly? Well, because automatically the generator will create a variable called camera page and set it to one, two, three, and four, all done automatically for you by the generator. The generator itself is right here and it can be configured. This is super hardcore stuff. Don't touch it, okay? Don't touch the generators. 
we are not ready to show you that yet. Notice how the camera selector is also driven by this variable, show cam selector, show. And if that is not true, then it's just going to blank out. No, notice what happens here. This, this blue line, the blue line up there, I click the bottom edge. Now it's invisible, right? And it will fall through down to the presets. So the presets you see right now are actually never disabled. They are just always lying underneath the camera selector, which is, by the way, the reason why we have these blank behaviors on this layer. That's a little detail I figured out myself yesterday. I forgot. I made this a year ago. So this is, um, yeah, it's sometimes new for me as well. Um, so there you see the camera selector. The, the, the camera control layers are um, like an exercise in and of itself. But if you go inside of them, it is so that since the menus of each camera is unique, like in this case, we have included Canon PTC cameras and we have included Panasonic PTC cameras. It means that depending on which camera we're choosing, let's just see this. You know, we have currently the Canon um, the Canon menu is visible. So I changed to a different Canon camera. It's going to be the same. But now I changed to a Panasonic camera. You see now the Panasonic section is enabled. And that is now what is driving the menu, but also the presets that underlies this. So uh, th this is the idea. And if I added a Visca camera, it would automatically insert a new configuration. We should try that just because let's just add manually. Let's say Visca, sorry, Sony. Sony would be Visca camera like always. Just select this guy, go back to the configuration tab. The fact that we selected a single Visca camera means that now here, it automatically included a configuration for Visca cameras. So if I find a way to navigate to the Sony camera, this one, boom. There you go, we have the Visca layers enabled and both the Canon and the Panasonic layers are not enabled anymore. If we go further inside of this, the page called camera adjustments is where we are basically cycling the menu. You see that? So the visibility of these is depending on setting page, the variable setting page, which is all the way down here and managed by the top edge of this button. And it is cycling through the options that is given to us by the configuration for Sony Visca cameras. Preset control is in here, and this is where you see the preset pages. So if I go to the preset pages, you can see I'm cycling forth and back on the edges of this button. And I think if you explode this, you probably explode your brain as well. But that's how it works. And um, this is all the code it takes to give you all that convenience of having easy selecting cameras in the home page, tally forwarding, routing triggers. In each of these, you could pick configurations that I mean, by time, you could have like a super tight Canon PDC configuration, very easy, you could have an expanded one, we are already working on that. For instance, I think for for Visca cameras, we are coming out with a like extended bird dog configuration, and so on that is giving you access to additional cool features for um, the coolest cameras on the market. So that's all the convenience you get out here. That is programmed in the configuration tab and will really be intimidating to to I mean, it will kill you if you try to understand that on your first day with reactor. But um, we understand it. And uh, it is here to facilitate that that home screen. And you can use many of these principles inside your own layers, if you will. So I hope I have inspired you to um, try this out on your own and uh, build complex navigational schemes that you could never have done on Unisketch. In my quest to show you all the cool things inside of the configuration tab for the default PC fly configuration, I completely forgot the thing that I thought was the most important, actually the navigation key. We want to see how the navigation key has been done inside the Skyway procured configuration. Because we have seen how we could navigate on the sides, top and bottom edges. How is this actually done in the config? I'm not telling you that this is necessarily going to be like a pleasant uh, view because we, we might have improvised a number of things and built stuff on that um, you that I, I just don't know. We'll just go and check if this is meaningful to us. But we'll go into normal operation here <clears throat> and then we will see. Let me see. No, somehow it feels like it's not here. No, 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 no. It's uh, it's the menu navigation button. This is the one. OK, so that is. The, we are now going to look at how this one has been created. Uh, we'll use show more here. And then you, we, we can see we have a number of event handlers. We have some default feedback going on. And it will probably expose features that you didn't even know existed in here. 
Okay, so let's just check the event handlers at first. That's what makes the button tick when we press. So we have something called adjust menu. <clears throat> and I would be curious to see what is the uh, parameter of the IO reference. That's the setting page. Uh, previously in this video, we have seen setting page here is what uh, changes the menu on the, um, on, on the buttons uh, up here. So we could just emulate this. And in other words, now what is it doing? It's, it's actually reacting on the act up. Notice that. And it has the top edge. So if I if I press and hold and then I release, as I'm releasing, notice it is ah, come on, don't scroll. As I am releasing, what happened there? Let's just go forth and back here. We are looking at the oh, 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 oh no. <laughs> I got into the engineering menu. I need to get out of that one. <laughs> okay, so it is um, the, the top edge. As I'm pressing the top edge and I'm releasing, I'm cycling the menu. That's what we are seeing right here. It's cycling over, up and rolling over, settings all, that's nice. This is the settings page parameter. But we also have an event preprocessor because this one has been doubled with another one, the one called engineering menu. If you look at that one, it's also on the top edge and it's also cycling up on a variable called engineering menu, which is somehow hidden somewhere in here. But basically, engineering menu is the secret pathway into some settings like IP address and so on. Let's just do it once again. So we can actually see what the engineering menu gives us. It gives us the sleep time, the dim time of the panel, display brightness, LED brightness. We even have some stuff down here. Oh, that's useful for PTC operation, inverting the directions of pan, tilt and zoom. That's nice, isn't it? And uh, that's what you get in the engineering menu. The engineering menu just got enabled right here when Oh, wait, this is the engineering menu layer. It has these uh, uh, sorry, behaviors defined that are the ones that you see right here. And then it has two pages on top of it, which I think we may cycle. We are cycling them on the upper edge, are we? Or how is it now? Let me see. It has me confused somehow. Where's the engineering pages variable? Maybe on the sides here. Yeah, yeah, OK, it's on the sides. So maybe we'll discover that in a moment because we are, yeah, we're actually overriding the menu navigation. You see that? So when we are in the menu, on the, the engineering menu, menu navigation is changed over to something else. In, in, in essence, this button is now captured and substituted by this behavior until we press the exit button. Boom. And there the whole engineering menu is disabled because this variable is changing to something else than on. And now we are falling back to the definition of the menu navigation right, right here down there. So once again, we click and hold. And the click and hold means that we change this variable so that the engineering menu is in place. Let's just go back again. Exit, exit. So <clears throat> we are here to, to explore the menu navigation. And this event handler would then, as I press and hold for like a second on the upper edge, enable that. And that event preprocessor is inside this one. This will be my first time pressing this edit icon to see how this is defined and if I can figure out the way that it's been set up in here. And I would say no. So right there, we hammered our head into something that either I'm too stupid to understand or this UI is just not finished yet. That is the reality when you dig that deep inside of Reactor, you may find things that are not brought out in a UI in a meaningful way just yet. But let us see the JSON code. I can show you the JSON code and then I can explain you how that works. So we'll just format this and give us a little bit more space to explore it. Can we? Um, OK, so event handlers, the one that we were looking for is the one called engineering menu. But I also want to see adjust menu because both of them uh, interesting. See, the adjust menu and the engineering menu are both detecting on the top edge of the button. The thing is that the one, it, only one of them will be triggered at any time. So they must have something mutually exclusive related to their event handlers. So this is the adjust menu event handler, and this is the event preprocessor. And what it basically says here is that any input edge that is pressed, on act down, we are not doing anything, on act up, we will forward an act up trigger in case the time window to the previous trigger is 1000. And uh, that means it will only send the act up if we release the button within 1000 milliseconds. 
So there you have your reaction on the top edge reacting to the to the release of the button, but it has to be within uh, 1000 milliseconds. This makes sense if you move on to the engineering menu because here you have the opposite. This is essentially the detect, uh, you know, the press and hold function. What it says is that um, any any input edge coming into us when we have an act down, we uh, start a uh, rep a, a um, an engine that is uh, detecting one repetition of this button. So basically, this is designed to have you press a button and then have a, a, a train of triggers coming for as long as you hold it. That, that's what we are doing here. Um, and that is used in some behaviors. We have designed master behaviors that allows you to have this. Uh, it's called step change long range. If that is something you have stumbled upon, it is something we use for values that span a, a large range, like from minus 100 to plus 100. You don't want to, to press a ton of times on a four-way button, but you can press and hold, and then it will it will automatically send triggers through that range. So um, th this is what we are doing, but we are making a single repetition, and we are also blocking the leading trigger. That means that the first time I hold it down, we block that. And then we wait for one repetition that comes after 1000 milliseconds. And I can't remember what delay it means. Oh, there's a little help. OK, so we could read that if we wanted to. Um, yeah, OK, repeat delay. That means that it will. Yeah, this is the repeat delay. That's the point. The um, I think the repetitions themselves are coming with some probably some distance of 200 milliseconds by default, but there's definitely some sort of setting we can we can change that for. Uh, I wonder if we see repeat frequency. So that would be where you say, okay, five, that would give you 200 milliseconds if you want five hertz on the frequency. Uh, so basically we are saying that the repetition should be delayed by 1000 milliseconds. We should only have one repetition after which it should stop and it should output an act down trigger. And then on act up, we need to put in this one that is stopping the repetition engine. So that's the coding. This is the coding that goes into creating a press and hold feature on these buttons. And that's what gives you the engineering menu. Let's get back up to the triggers here. I told you this is going to be really hot stuff. Um, the page cameras, that would be the function that when we press the sides of this button, we are paging forth and back. And in this case, it has been handled differently than we did. It is uh, using a pulsed encoder um, handler type, and that <laughs> that's done out of convenience because using pulsed encoders, which was not a part of our training, means that automatically we benefit from uh, still. Yeah, we are doing we actually doing a trigger conversion as well here. Maybe we have more success in doing so if we click in because you can see that for um, this this means that if we have binary incoming triggers like from a four way button, then if we press the left, left edge, it is going to do something. If I maybe click here, why is this? It's not passed through. I feel like I want to see more info, but somehow it doesn't give it to me. So we'll need to go into the JSON code again for this one. The um, yeah, so choosing a handler type pulsed means that we are basically setting this up to react to an encoder. But because we have the event preprocessor, we are changing four way button triggers from left and right edges into encoder pulses plus and minus. And then we don't need to do a whole lot of other things. The same would be true for the page presets. But in both cases, you can see that we have this condition that says if camera selector is show or if camera selector is not show, that's the mutually exclusive condition. That means whether we are paging presets or paging cameras, that is in place as well. So there we have something that we also utilized to make sure that our paging function uh, which was then split into two event handlers, was actually detecting whether we were in the one or the other mode. And then finally, we have here the toggle camera function. And on toggle camera, we um, are binary uh, button trigger type. We have the bottom edge. We are cycling up, rolling over. This is all plain vanilla. So no worries about that one. That's, that's um, straightforward. So I, I just want to check because we looked at it, the page cameras where we were using the pulsed trigger acceptance or accept trigger pulsed. Then we have this binary to pulsed event preprocessor. And now we can see the values that I couldn't figure out how to do in the UI. Um, if the input edge is left, then we send um, and it's on act down, then we we create a pulse value of minus one. Minus one is counterclockwise pulses, and it will be a forward pulse one 
if we press the right edge instead. And the same would be true for the presets for pages. We are also having an event preprocessor converting the four-way button left and right edges into encoder pulses, which is then forwarded into handling of this um, IO reference. And if you have an IO reference like this that has a spam, then we don't even need we don't need what we needed for the binary handlers, namely the set value or the binary set value, which had to be set to the uh, behaviors colon, IO reference colon, all, to get all the possible values of the variable into the set of values that we would cycle through. It's not necessary because automatically any pulse behavior will, will take that full set of options for any parameter and work with that within that range. That's the default behavior that um, I'm not even sure you can escape it. If you wanted to escape it, then you would convert pulse triggers into binary triggers and handle it with a binary um, accept trigger handle type here. So uh, that was my ending of um, this exploration into how to create this complex navigation scheme. I think we saw a lot of things being the same. We also had a few surprises and we got a chance to look at event preprocessors quite a lot and noticed how there was a more clever way to do the paging for the presets and cameras. Actually a pattern that you would more often stumble upon than having two individual um, event handlers doing those. Thanks for watching.